من الشيطان العين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والحمد لله الذي لا يبلغ مدحته القائلون ولا يحصي نعماءه العادون ولا يودي حقه المجتهدون الذي لا يدركه بعد الهمم ولا يناله غوص الفطن الذي ليس لصفته حد محدود ولا نعت موجود ولا وقت معدود ولا أجل ممدود فترى الخلائق بقدرته ونشر الرياح برحمته وودد بالصخور ميدان أرضه ثم الصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين خاتم النبيين شفيع المذنبين حبيب إله العالمين أبي القاسم المصطفى محمد صل على أدم وعلى محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين ولأنة الله على أعدائهم أجمعين من يوم عداوتهم إلى يوم الدين أما بعد فقد قال الله عز وجل في كتابه الحكيم وهو أستق القائلين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وقل ربي أدخلني مدخل الصدق وأخرجني مخرج الصدق وجعل لي من لدنك سلطانا نصيرا آمنا بالله صدق الله العلي العظيم صلي على محمد وآل محمد السلام عليكم جميعا ورحمة الله وبركاته I begin in the name of Allah, the most kind, the most merciful. It's due to that kindness and mercy that we have these opportunities where we gather in remembrance and reflection and glorification of Him, Tabaraka wa Ta'ala. We then begin this sermon the way the commander of the faithful would begin many of his by advising us, Usikum ibadallah bi taqwallah, that I advise you, all the servants of God, to be God conscious, God fearing, and pious human beings. We are on that journey of self-reformation in these first sermons and we have reached that stage of talking about the importance of pure intention for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, ikhlas niya. And last time that we were together, we talked about some of the gifts or some of the benefits that are associated with one who strives to be sincere for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we've talked about what does it mean, so to repeat it would be a repetition, you know. Um, some of the benefits associated, we said, with being sincere for a prolonged period of time until it becomes a normal practice for us is that one, Allah will gift us with wisdom, hikmah. And we talked about the importance of wisdom in our lives. It will also lead to our actions being purified and accepted by God. We said this is an important point and I think it's worthy of reminding. You know that Oftentimes, even though we may be sincere in what we want to do, the result of that action may not be what we intended. Because we are not in control of how other people respond. We're not in control with different factors that take place in our lives. Yet, because we were pure, Allah will accept the result with the best of acceptance. Even though the action may not be what we had sought out to be. Allah will also subhanahu wa ta'ala make things subservient for us and He will raise us from being a mukhlis to a mukhlas. And again, this is the completion of the benefits and the success. Today we wrap up the, the last half of this discussion and that is that how, what prevents us from becoming sincere. And it's good to be able to understand and analyze the roadblocks that are in front of us so that we make sure we can avoid them and navigate them successfully. Today we'll discuss two of them. Next week, inshallah, we will discuss the third in more detail. The first is what prevents us from being sincere to God the way we should be is weakness in our faith. And, you know, whenever I say this, I have to always remind, you know, that there is always room for perfection when it comes to faith. There is never a point in our lives we will reach to where we will say, Alhamdulillah, I've, I've, I've mastered Iman. You know, that's never the case. Allah says in the Quran, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu, aminu billahi wa rasulihi. O you who have faith, have more faith in Allah and His Prophet. That means there are levels of Iman that we can have. 
the general rule that we understand from our ulama who get it from the Quran and Hadith is that whenever we fail to do what we know we have to do or whenever we are inconsistent in our actions towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala either we don't do what God wants or we are inconsistent sometimes we do sometimes we don't it goes back to the fact that our faith needs more improvement yeah and that's something that we should be willing to accept and 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 use that as motivation one of the lines that i repeat often that was ingrained in us as teachers is that you pray and we pray that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shows us our deficiencies in this world before we are exposed of it in the hereafter and so when we get a reminder from allah that look you can do better you can strive better this is one of those examples if i am inconsistent in my sincerity I can strive to become more in my iman and have more iman through study, through reflection, through strengthening my belief and then you back that up with action. You see it's one thing to have theoretical knowledge, mashallah, we have a ton of theoretical knowledge, right? We can prove the existence of God, we can prove qiyamah, we can prove all of these things. But do our actions line up with that faith or that knowledge and this is where the action becomes essential to prove how much faith we have to ourselves more than anything else the second obstacle in our journey to sincerity is that we have not controlled our desires yeah? our desires are rampant Amir al-Mu'mineen Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam wow. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad. He reports in a tradition, Kaifa yastati ul ikhlas man yaglibahu al hawa. He says, How is it possible for one to attain or become sincere when their desires constantly overpower them? Yeah? Where their desires are controlling them? Um, you know, the, the concept of desires has always been extremely intriguing for me because we have to understand how desires work. We always talk about desires in the negative sense, you know, that desires are bad, we should control our desires, when in fact, you know, Allah has given us innate desires. We are born with desires. We're born with the desire to sleep, to eat, to drink, to have love in our lives. These are normal desires, desire for health, desire for safety. We all have these desires. And so they are something that we are born with. And if it's something that we are born with, what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants from us is to use them to bring us success in dunya, which will translate in success in akhirah. So desires are essential. Don't ever pound on your desires. What we have to do is control our desires. Because what begins to happen, and this is a normal flow of life, you will notice this in all aspects of our existence. The more we use something, the more that particular object becomes dominant in our lives. Right? Um, if one uh, sleeps a lot, that's all they can think about. If one, for example, watches TV a lot, that's all they can think about. If one games a lot, that's all they can think about. If one um, is in love and reads the Quran a lot, that's all they will be able to think about because whatever it is that we do and we put our heart into it, it becomes a dominant aspect of our lives. And when it comes to desire, it's very similar. You know, we have to use our desires, right? Um, I eat when I'm hungry, for example, right? This is normal. We eat when we're hungry. What begins to happen is that after I eat, I feel happy. Now, instead of realizing that my happiness is not coming from eating, rather my happiness is something that God wants me to attain through eating, but my mind has flipped it to say that you will only be happy when you eat. And so what begins to happen is that our desires begin to tell us, keep eating, keep eating, keep eating, right? Keep sleeping, whatever it is that we do, and you think about it, this happens from the time we are babies, right? Um, a baby will cry. What will happen? Their mom or dad or sibling will pick them up and the baby stops crying. The baby has learned something powerful that if I want attention, I just have to cry. And you imagine that a child who's a, who's a baby learns that. Imagine as we get older how powerful our desires become and we, we change the trajectory. And now instead of us using our desires, our desires begin to use us. And to get their objectives. And this is where Allah says in the Quran, 
Ara'ayta man ittakhadha ilahahu? Ahsantum. Hawa. He says, have you seen the one who takes his desires as his ilah, as his Allah? That means whatever, that desire becomes the compass. That desire becomes the driving force in our lives. And this is something that if we are not careful or rein it in, it begins to dominate our lives. There's a really beautiful hadith from Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam ma salli ala muhammadin wa ali muhammad he says that iblis says this you know iblis says ahlaktuhum bil dhunub fa ahlakuni bil istighfar he says i destroyed them or attempted to destroy them with sins and they destroyed me back with seeking forgiveness from allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so they found a balance through that but then he says, فَلَمَّا رَأَيْتُ ذَلِكُ He said, well, when I saw that this is the methodology that they are using, he says, I destroyed them with their own desires. So they think that they are guided and they don't seek forgiveness anymore. Yeah? When we follow our desires, we think we're doing something right, isn't it? Yeah? That Allah has made this halal for me, so what's the big deal? Right? Allah has allowed me to do this, what's the big deal? Allah wants me to earn a livelihood, what's the big deal? Well, yes, Allah wants these things, but how we do it is important to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The methodologies that we take to attain the results that God wants is important to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And therefore, in our lives, we have to be able to check our desires. You know, I don't think any one of us are sinners. I don't think we are sinners. But to gain control over our nafs so that our life becomes sincerely for God and not for our desires, we have to check our desires from time to time. Yeah? To make my actions pure, I'm repeating the statement because this is how we bring it back to sincerity. To make my actions sincere for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I have to say no to my desires from time to time. Because otherwise I work for my desires, I don't work for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We'll end with this hadith, something to reflect about. Our seventh Imam Al Kadhim alayhi afdalu salatu wa salam. Ma salli ala Muhammadin wa ali Muhammad. He says, Ida marra bika amran. La tadri ayyuhuma khair wa aswab. He says that when two things come your way and you don't know which one is good and correct. Yani they're both halal naturally, right? They're both allowed because otherwise it'd be very simple for us to say what is good, what is bad, what is allowed, what is not. No, these are both options that I have. Should I do this or should I do that? The Imam alayhi salam says, he says, فَانْظُرْ أَيُّهُمَا أَقْرَبُ إِلَى هَوَاكْ فَخَالِفُ He says, look to see which one of these two is closer to your desires and then oppose it. And don't do that one. Whichever you desire for more, just say, no, I'll do the other one instead. Imagine how powerful that is. Man, that takes a lot of courage. Okay? That takes a lot of courage to be able to do that. You know? um, like you have an option of, of watching another episode on Netflix or going to sleep. Both halal. Yeah? But see which one you want more. And then do the opposite. Yeah? And the more we do this, our desires begin to get in control and our actions become sincere for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wa akhiru da'wan an alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim. Bismillahi ar-rahman ar-rahim. Wa la'asri inna al-insana lafi khusr illa al-lazina amanu wa amilu al-salihat. Wa tawasaw bil-haq wa tawasaw bil-sabr. Sadaq Allahu al-aliyu al-azim. صلي على إمام محمد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان العين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والحمد لله قاسم الجبارين مبير الظالمين مدرك الهاربين نكال الظالمين صريخ المستصرخين موضع حاجات الطالبين معتمد المؤمنين 
اللهم صل على خاتم النبيين وسيد المرسلين محمد اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد وصل على سيد الوصيين أمير المؤمنين علي بن أبي طالب عليه السلام محمد وآل محمد وصل على الصديقة الطاهرة فاطمة الزهراء سيدة نساء العالمين اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد وصل على سبت الرحمة وإمام الهدى الحسن والحسين سيد شباب أهل الجنة صل على محمد وآل محمد وصلي على علي بن الحسين ومحمد بن علي وجعفر بن محمد وموسى بن جعفر وعلي بن موسى ومحمد بن علي وعلي بن محمد والحسن بن علي والحجة القائم المهدي صلي على محمد وآل محمد صلاة لا غاية لعددها ولا نهاية لمددها ولا نفاد لأمدها اللهم اغفر للمؤمنين والمؤمنات والمسلمين والمسلمات الأحياء منهم والأموات وتابع بيننا وبينهم بالخيرات إنك مجيب الدعوات إنك على كل شيء قدير اللهم صل على Tomorrow night, inshallah, we will be celebrating the birth anniversary of the Lady of Light, Sayyidah Fatima al-Zahra, alayha afzalu salatu wa salam. Allahumma salli ala Muhammadin wa ali Muhammad. And if we want to benefit from her light and be enveloped in her light, naturally we have to learn from her light. We have to learn from her life. And today I would like to again, as we had done a few weeks ago, just talk about one aspect of her life that can be practically applied in, her, in our lives. You know, one of her beautiful titles is that she is known as Al-Mubaraka. Yeah? Al-Mubaraka means the one who is blessed. And it comes from the word Baraka. You know, Baraka is something that we have it in all of our languages. The word Baraka is used and Mubarak is used. But the word Baraka itself from a lexical or a, from, an, from a transla- translation perspective, it means something that in itself has an abundance of goodness and then that goodness from it multiplies. Yeah? That is what is something that is Mubarak. When we say Mubarak to somebody, it's because whatever it is that they have done is blessed. We say to a child who is born, someone who gets married, we say Mubaraki, Mubaraki, we say in all of our languages. What we are actually conveying is that whatever it is that you are doing is blessed. And inshallah, through it, more blessings come. Right? And so when a person is called Mubarak, it's because they themselves inherently are blessed. Yeah? There are some blessings in them. And others benefit from that blessing. And I think this is a very beautiful title of hers. And we can see this applied in so many different aspects of her lives. You know, she is Mubaraka when it comes to her progeny. You think about it today, that from four children, today the millions of Sadats that come from that progeny of Sayyidah Zahra alayhi salam. Yeah? How blessed, how blessed she is that her progeny, you know, when they made fun of the Prophet that say that you are Abtar, and look at him today, where his progeny is remembered by so many. This is the blessing of Sayyidah Zahra, alayhi salam, you know. Her worship was blessed, that not only was she illuminated in her worship, but we find in traditions that she made light, that she was a light for the inhabitants of the heavens. And so that was a blessing that others benefited from as as well. And then she was blessed in her giving. You know, there are many stories about her giving. I want to share one. And I know that you have all heard this story. But you know, they're like the stories of Haidar, that no matter how many times we hear them, we still feel good hearing them again. And this is the story of her necklace. Uh, You know, it is said that once a very elderly and a poor man comes to the mosque of the Prophet, he was seated next to his companions. And it's interesting that some of the companions who he was seated with were wealthy, like Ammar bin Yasir. Ammar bin Yasir was, alhamdulillah, well-to-do. Yet, when this man comes and he says to the Prophet, Ya Rasulullah, I am poor, I am in need, I am a foreigner, and I need something that will bring barakah into my lives, blessings into my lives. He says, go to the house of my daughter Fatima. Yeah? You will find barakah in that house. Subhanallah, you know. 
it's it was not so many lessons yeah there it the prophet knew that fatima alayha salam was not well to do yeah we know of stories where they would go to sleep hungry as a family yet he said go to her house you know and i think that a lesson in there sometimes comes to us that when someone comes to our door for needs you don't think allah knows that we may not be that well off today you don't think allah knows that we may not have enough to give today but the fact that allah sent that person to our door it says something to us yeah that do not turn away a blessing that has come an opportunity to assist that has come to us so she goes to the house he goes to the house of fatima fatima alayhi salam says i don't have much to give you know but she remembered she had a necklace that she had and so she gave this necklace to him now again she could have sold that necklace for her own children but she didn't because maybe together they endure the trials that god has placed before them the man goes to the prophet and he says to him that what blessings did you bring back from the house of fatima and he says that i brought back this necklace yeah and the prophet began to cry and he says how can there not be baraka in this when it was given to you by fatima it means he knew right that whatever it is she did was blessed it was filled with baraka and so the prophet says who is willing to buy this necklace from this man because what is the man going to do with the necklace at the end of the day and so ammar yasir stands up and he says i will buy it from you he says what do you wish for it and so he gave him 20 dinar he gave him 100 dirham he gave him meat bread and a ride to go back to his town imagine all of that for one particular necklace and then ammar took the necklace home it is said he put perfume on this necklace he wrapped it in a cloak and he gave it to a servant and he says go and deliver this back to fatima yeah and when he says that go and he says that when you deliver this to fatima i also put you now in the custody of fatima that means you serve that house from now on the servant goes to the house of fatima he gives her this necklace as soon as fatima alayha salam receives the necklace she says to the man the servant you are free and you are a free man today you can leave my service this man this this freed slave freed servant now comes to the house of the comes to the mosque of the prophet and again he cries and he says how much baraka in this one necklace of fatima az zahra yeah that this one necklace fed the hungry made the poor rich freed a slave and it returned back to its owner sallu ala muhammad wa ali muhammad salli ala muhammad wa ali muhammad beauty in the actions of fatima alayhi salam this is what baraka is it goes around and it will come back to us you know when we do something sincerely for god it's never lost it's never lost yeah it will come back to us in ways that we could not even imagine and so the lesson that i want us to take from this i give it to myself first and to you that ensure and try our best that no matter what we do we try to do it in the most beautiful manner possible yeah in the most beautiful manner possible so that it increases in goodness you have akhlaq don't just have ordinary akhlaq have great akhlaq yeah um when you are giving something give with the purest of intentions even if it's small the, the amount the quantity never matters to god it's the quality that comes behind that giving that matters to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and when we do these type of things inshallah not only will they benefit us it will benefit others and it will be considered as being blessed by allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wa akhiru da'wan an alhamdulillahi rabbil alamin bismillahir rahmanir rahim qul huwa allahu ahad allahu samad lam yalid wa lam yulad wa lam yakun lahu kufuwan ahad sadaqallahu al aliyyul azim